reacting to WordPress evolving journey of plugin development. Oh, okay. uh, that's a little bit of a wordy title. It's a 20 pitch, so I'm going to stick with it. But um, maybe I'll uh, pass me. Um, and I'm Jonathan Williams. I'm a developer here at Boston University. So welcome, everyone. We're happy to have you. Uh, and let me see, get into what we're talking about. So I'm going to talk about the process that we went through to uh, develop a particular plugin. There's not actually going to be a lot of code, but I'm going to talk about how we thought about the code. So uh, reacting. What I'm talking about is heading to where the ball is going, not where it is, anticipating events. Um, I and a lot of other people were really happy with how the US women's team did in the last World Cup. I noticed that's something they tend to do. So. Um, the web is not going to stop moving anytime soon. Uh, and in order to catch up, to keep going, we have to anticipate the outcome of changes that are in process, not just wait for things to be complete and then react on them. And also, it's a play on words, because React.js is crucial to how WordPress is moving forward. And we think it's a, a strategic to, to where BU um, needs to go with our publishing. Evolving. So education is evolving just like WordPress. Uh, things are also moving quickly in the education space. Just as more culture moves online and becomes digital, education has to keep up. And digital publishing is more than just words on a page. We all know how powerful interactive components, video, pictures, and no disrespect to words on a page. This presentation brought to you entirely by words on a page. <laughs> but for education, we kind of need to go uh, past that. And as digital tools become more powerful, there's more online free content. What kind of content is going to win? What is it that people are going to pay attention to? Because not all online free content is created. Some things are good for you, some things are bad. So can a university like you contribute to the online ecosystem in a way that can privilege good free content, educational content. Um, the bad can crowd out the good if good people aren't working hard to keep good content available. And a journey. So really what I'm going to talk about is how we got from point A to point B. Uh, we were commissioned to uh, develop this uh, plugin that I'm going to describe. And we had a plan. I put together a proposal. It took a couple of years to get the pro proposal funded. But instead of following a traditional waterfall process where we had a plan, we followed the plan, the world changed in the meantime, but we didn't pay attention, we just followed the plan. That wasn't what we did here. We had adaptive goals. We went through an iterative process of setting goals. Um, and we recognized that we had unanswered questions in our original plan. And we actually left some room in the process to experiment and have the outcome of those experiments uh, influence where the project ultimately went. It was also an interesting journey because of the multidisciplinary team that we had. I was on the um, developer side. We were working, working closely with faculty directly, staff, um, and it was our uh, close contact with the stakeholders, the people funding the project, that I think really gave us an opportunity to experiment more than we would have otherwise. Uh, if the stakeholders had just said, we want something that looks like this, you go out and build it, and we build whatever we think they want, come back, and by that point it's too late. If it wasn't if it didn't meet all the objectives, we wouldn't have had a chance to adapt because we would have been done. And a plugin. So this is the software that I'm going to be talking about. This is what the journey was about. So um, the plugin is called BU Learning Blocks. It's for uh, publishing online curricula. And as a component of that, we also created um, 
a toolkit for interactive questions and quizzes. Uh, it's a standalone NPM package called React Questions. So I'm mostly going to talk about the process of how we develop these, but hopefully I'll do some time at the end for questions and if we actually want to look at the software some. So, BU Learning Blocks is a WordPress plugin for lightweight, open, online learning. So, what is it? It's designed to be a free and interactive alternative to required textbooks. And I put that in bold because this is really the challenge, at the heart of the challenge that was our mandate to um, textbooks are really expensive. Um, it's something that faculty are really struggling with because students are under a lot of financial pressure in a lot of ways, and all of these very expensive textbooks aren't helping that. So it's also designed to be an innovative contribution to the field of open educational resources, OERs. Um, so we're not trying to replace anything else out there. This is an additive project that's designed to address a very specific kind of online educational resource, which is something that a faculty member, or any educator really, wants to put online uh, for free as part of kind of the creative common spirit of, of free online resources. So it's also a project that aligns directly with the VU Library we're uh, working with uh, closely on this. And for, for me as a developer, um, one of the most interesting parts of the mandates, and it really informed most of our decision making, is trying to get away from any dependency on proprietary software. I think we all are probably familiar with the phenomenon of vendor locking, right? Um, and that's one of the power Part of the power of open software is not just that the software itself is free, but that the things that you make with the software aren't encumbered, encumbered by uh, the, the data that, the formats that that, that software uses uh, to store things. The, the libraries care a lot about preserving things in the long term, um, and it's very difficult to Preserve things that are in non-standard formats, something that a particular company owns, because if that company goes under, if you're a librarian, what do you do with that? It's a very difficult problem. So it's we're looking at the short term, but also uh, the long term. So but it's also a collaboration with BU's Digital Learning and Innovation Center. And we I'll get into a little bit with uh, that center and, and how we work with them and some, some of the other uh, stakeholders that were directly involved. So what is involved? Because I've already fielded just talking about this uh, talk, a uh, couple of uh, questions. You know, there are a lot of other things out there. The LMS space, uh, learning management systems, that's a fairly crowded space. There aren't a lot of players, but there are, you know, uh, at least three really big ones. Um, so, Bulb isn't a replacement for those kinds of systems. Uh, we're not trying to be a MOOC, massively online, uh, massive open online course. We're specifically trying to fill um, a need around uh, open content with uh, self-assessment quizzes. So that's what we targeted for this for this first phase. Uh, people often ask, well, what if I wanted to use your software to actually do tests online and, and do grading? Um, we've, we've talked about that. That could be uh, an interesting avenue for uh, a future phase of development. But in order to address the, the primary concern of uh, open online content, we're choosing to focus on um, a system that doesn't require that you sign in, for example. I'm going to grade you as a student and you're taking a test, I have to know who you are. If I'm just saying, here's a quiz, take the quiz so that you know how well you're doing understanding this 
uh, this particular subject, then I don't have to know anything about you. I can just put everything online, and it sidesteps a whole lot of uh, issues. So those were some of the choices that we made in terms of, of how we focused our, our development efforts and what our development goals were. So we had a really, I think, unique relationship with our stakeholders in this project because we worked so closely with them. So we had a, a persistent online chat room specifically for the project with the Slack or big Slack users. And this was really uh, invaluable because everybody was participating in this, the faculty, the staff, the development team. This is where we went to for questions when we needed to make decisions. This was part of what gave us the agility that we had and the ability to make rather drastic course corrections uh, because we could go back to the stakeholders and say, we think this might really address the project goals better than what we originally planned. And we can hash out those kinds of conversations here. If you can read it, this is just a, a, a screenshot of a, of a chat, and this is where uh, my colleague Danny uh, suggested that we were like, what so, this is the point in our chat where we <laughs> arrived at our name. So as I mentioned before, um, the project was uh, funded through BU's Digital Learning uh, and Innovation Center, which is very concerned with online digital instruction. So they, they're the ones who identified the need, identified the people who could most benefit, um, and secured the funding uh, for us to uh, take this on as a, as a funded project uh, at BU. I work in the ISAT department, so they came to us, uh, asked for a proposal, I worked on the original proposal, and uh, about two years later, we got funding and we could, we could get started. And as I mentioned, you may have mentioned, the, this concept of, of what we're aiming for, the open online content with uh, less formal self-assessment self quizzes is driven in part by a particular faculty, uh, Dr. Wayne Lamore, who has a uh, online curriculum like this uh, focused around epidemiology. Uh, it's very well recognized. It's um, gotten a lot of attention for being a successful model for online curriculum, and we really looked to uh, uh, that project and Wayne to tell us, you know, if we're able to deliver these features, um, will that accomplish this particular goal? Um, because I think everybody uh, was really impressed with how successful this particular uh, online resource is. So that's kind of the, the setup. Uh, so once we got funded, we got underway, uh, and I'm gonna describe how we went through the process of building this plugin. And in particular, I'm gonna talk about how we handled the two different components, the front end and the back end. Because um, that's kind of that tunnel that we traveled. I also want to uh, have a shout out here to WordPress. Um, because I, re I was going through my slides, I didn't realize I didn't mention WordPress at all uh, since it's a WordPress con conference. So the reason why, um, part of the reason why this came about as a WordPress plugin is first we use a lot of, of WordPress here at BU. We're, we have thousands of WordPress sites. It's, it's a very strategic platform for us. Um, but it's also important, again, because of its open source na nature, um, it's a non-proprietary data format, and it's free to use. And that's very important in the conception of this. Again, because we're working with the libraries, we want to build something that's going to last, that can be preserved. And that's one thing that I've noticed in digital culture and the web and online living, the things that survive best long term are the things that people are still using. 
if something's locked up behind a wall and nobody's had a chance to pay attention to it for a long time, when the Grim Reaper comes by clearing out hard drive space, that stuff is the first to go. Whereas if it's something that somebody's gonna notice it gets knocked offline, somebody's gonna say, hey, I was using that course, it's much more likely to be preserved. All right, now I'm actually gonna start talking about software. So as I mentioned, we started from a proposal. We had a plan that was really written around uh, 2017. Uh, it was focused around some very standard building blocks of how we're used to building things in WordPress with PHP. Custom post types, uh, CMB2, which is the custom meta blocks plugin, which is very pervasive. It's a very uh, standard part of uh, a lot of people's WordPress toolkits. And uh, really uh, jQuery focused uh, front end uh, interface, uh, specifically for the quizzes. Uh, and in fact, uh, the original proposal was based around a particular jQuery plugin called SlickQuiz that does front end interactivity for uh, quiz style questions. So that's where we started. So, very early on, in the development process. We started, we started writing code. We got, you know, we had, we had a GitHub repo, there was code in that. We were uh, publishing things, we were putting things in a sandbox, we were putting it in front of the stakeholders. And pretty early on, we were looking at all of this CMB2 and custom post type stuff. And we were looking at Gutenberg. Um, I think this was before 5.0 had shipped, so Gutenberg wasn't uh, part of core yet, but it was clear that it was going to be. And we started asking ourselves, what do we like better? Custom meta blocks or uh, custom, uh, yeah, custom meta boxes or Gutenberg blocks? And as we uh, started having this discussion with our uh, stakeholders, um, they kind of started agreeing with what we were saying was like, is actually better. Maybe that kind of block-based approach is actually going to be more likely to survive long term. It's going to hit more of our uh, project goals. So then it became a question of, okay, well, we already started. Are we willing to just throw out code that we had already developed and start over again? Uh, and we decided, yes, we are willing to throw things out. So we started a brand new plugin using the Create Gutenberg block framework, uh, which is really uh, quite good. And we took a we took a big productivity hit. We had to tell the stakeholders, "Hey, this is going to now take us longer than we anticipated." And everybody decided, "Okay, that's worth it." It also gave us uh, an opportunity to change the had been calling it um, few learning modules. And we're like, what is a module anyway? So uh, we, once we had just made the Gutenberg decision, we were like, hey, we can call it blocks. Why don't we call it few learning blocks? That gives us a great acronym bulb. Uh, we're all very proud of that. I think it's a great name. Um, and so we switched the back end, but that didn't necessarily change our front end strategy. Right, so we're still like, okay, we're going to use Slick Quiz on the, uh, on the front end, but we're going to completely re-engineer re what we're thinking for the back end. So as we developed, we started getting uh, further into uh, Gutenberg, into JavaScript. We ejected from the Create Gutenberg framework. Uh, that was kind of a big step for us because uh, then we lost kind of that, uh, keeping things updated within that framework, but it gave us the opportunity to customize our Webpack compile stage, uh, gave us some more flexibility in our uh, CSS and, and SAS handling. So that we, we talked about, do we want to eject, do we not want to eject, we went ahead and that kind of furthered us down along 
very JavaScript uh, centric path. But we still kept uh, the slick quiz on the front end. One of the things that gave us is slick quiz works from a JSON based uh, data format, essentially. The way slick quiz works is you assemble a JSON object, you give it to slick quiz, slick quiz renders the whole thing. So uh, that, because we were coming from uh, Gutenberg on the editing end, uh, taking that and turning the Gutenberg block into a JSON object is actually very practical. Uh, and there's a great way to inject JSON into the front end from the editor. You can actually use different P and Q scripts to do that directly. Uh, it's kind of a, a pattern that, that we're starting to see. Uh, it's a little non-intuitive because it's not a script, right? Usually you're queuing something like your jQuery plugin, but you can just queue raw data uh, into the front end using WP and Q scripts. So we knew that that might uh, pop out at a certain point because we knew that we had question types that were in our spec that we were on the hook for that Slick Quiz didn't have. But the, using this JSON bridge of, okay, we're in Gutenberg, we're gonna wrap everything up in a JSON object and just send it to the front end, we'll worry about the front end later, was actually a really good strategy because we could concentrate during that part of the project development on the back end and solve all of our back end problems and still have something to demonstrate, to say this is what it's gonna look like on the front end uh, without having to worry about those front end decisions for a while. So it gave us some breathing space to really work out what, what we wanted to do in the Gutenberg editor uh, without getting tripped up and we can't, we can't have the stakeholder view this because that worked out pretty well, I think. So, once we got that worked out, then we started uh, um, to face the question of, well, what are we gonna do about the stuff that Slick Quiz doesn't handle? So this was the next part of that, um, that close collaboration with the stakeholders. We hit another one of those, um, kind of articulation points in the plan. We knew that Slick Quiz might not be the thing that we would wind up with in Group 5. We, that, we specifically said that at the outset. So we hit this point and we're like, okay, since we're doing so much React for the Gutenberg editor anyway, what if we just wrote our own question from scratch in React? <laughs> we said, hey stakeholders, what do you think? Uh, and you know that was that was quite a serious discussion because we were aware that it was going to be another one of these productivity hits. We would have to say, hey, this is going to take longer. But making that choice, uh, we were we could be confident that we weren't going to we weren't going to wind up with just fighting with the limitations of a library that wasn't ours. If we were building it from scratch, we could be certain it was going to do exactly. So uh, my colleague Carlos uh, dove into that and uh, started building an entirely new uh, React library. And it's, uh, it's React questions, uh, and it's, we're importing it as an MPN package into the Gutenberg plugin. So it's actually a completely standalone interface component. Anybody can use it. Um, anywhere for, for anything, it's just a front end thing. And that is, that's the point where it's like, okay, we started with plan A, we replaced the front of the car, but left the, but we replaced the back of the car, left the front alone, then replaced, so then we wind up with a completely different car than what we started with. Um, and I know from experience in IT projects, that's just not, the most common outcome. It's much more frequent that you start out with a plan and reality be damned, you're gonna wind up with the outcome of that plan regardless of what else changed uh, in the world. Here we really kind of rebuilt the airplane while we were flying it. Uh, and that's, that's kind of the, the 
the gist of why I thought this might be a useful talk to describe how we were able to manage that process. So then once we were in really an entirely JavaScript world, uh, it, it gave us some more opportunities to, to, to leverage other modern frameworks. So uh, when I uh, took over working on the uh, React questions uh, part, it was, it was really pretty rough. Rough, and we needed more interface components, and I was able to just import Material UI, which is uh, Google's interface library. Um, and because we're already working in uh, an NPM land, I could just import that package, uh, and with uh, modern ES6, with uh, tree shaking, um, you can selectively import just the things that you need which is really rather different from, I'm just gonna include a whole library from a CDN and I'm stuck with that whole library. It, it really liberated us to start looking at things in different ways um, and build in some simplicity that, that might not otherwise be so practical. If the complexity around how to handle, for example, uh, accessibility for my radio buttons if I'm offloading some of that complexity onto Google, let's face it, Google will have billions of dollars to worry about that. We don't at BU. We have, we're not poor, but we don't have that kind of money to, to write interface components. Um, and because this is open online education, accessibility is a really, really core part of our mandate. Um, that's, some, that's an area where it's so easy for the existing tools to fall down. We can, we can deliver something that a blind person can also take our quiz, that's something that uh, our stakeholders at BU care an awful lot about. And anything we can do to get us closer to those accessibility goals um, is one of these ancillary victories that we can get from this, this process of really trying to stay agile and stay uh, nimble. <coughs> So that wound us up in really an ES6 everywhere uh, kind of approach, which was not where we started at all. And I was kind of terrified about it. I, you know, I don't need to get too far into the, the mechanics of where JavaScript is going, but for, for people who are familiar with this, there's what we call kind of ES5 JavaScript, which is JavaScript as, as it existed since Brent and I wrote it in the 90s up until now. And ES6 is a really radical, fairly radical shift of um, different ways of declaring variables, arrow functions, um, import export uh, statements, uh, a really different way of constructing JavaScript that I think makes it look more like things like Python, things like C Sharp, uh, more industrial languages. It's a really difficult shift to make. But once you can kind of let go of the ES5 style and start to really enjoy the, uh, the potential of what really operating in a fully modern JavaScript environment offers. Uh, once we made that shift, it was really uh, productive, I think. And uh, we were able to make a lot of progress again on replacing the interface component that we'd spec'd out, writing our own, but doing it quickly and effectively. And so the result of that is uh, published on NPM as its own uh, standalone package. You can import it into your own prog uh, um, projects if you so choose. And it's completely independent of WordPress, Gutenberg. It's kind of like slick quiz. It's a way that you can um, put some uh, questions on a page and you have somebody take a quiz. We used uh, NWB. Uh, which is a create React app-like framework for uh, um, starting a, a React component. It's a, it's a little more, I wasn't as familiar with it, uh, honestly, but it's more targeted towards building a self-contained library that you can publish on NPM that can be uh, consumed. And that's very powerful even for us. Like we have this question component, we need to move from version to version, we're also importing it as an NPM package. So that makes our version control within the plugin uh, 
really uh, a lot cleaner, a lot easier to, to comprehend. Decoupling in that way, uh, I think, is very helpful for us. What about local development, NPM? There's this thing, NPM link. Is it super useful? Yes, it's great, because you say, don't go to NPM for this package. I have it locally use this one. So you can make local changes. You don't have to publish your changes to NPM before you can pull them into your, your own local package. Is NPM link clear and easy to use? No, I would say not. Um, but it's really very powerful, and it's kind of the only way to, to do stuff like this. So, you know, that gave us some, some really interesting uh, questions of the front end styling. Um, I started out using this thing called CSS modules, which I think is just a cool idea. Every CSS style that you write gets compiled, uh, and it gets its own namespace, so you don't have to worry about CSS namespace collisions, which is, which is a huge problem. But NWB does, it, it compiles it great when you're working with dev, but it doesn't go to the final build, so we switched to, to SAS. Uh, I kept it so that we're only applying a single uh, style of elements. React is a lot easier that way. Uh, and we, that's the process that we took to come up with uh, a plugin that really satisfies uh, these very particular needs that that the libraries uh, and the digital learning and innovation were, were coming to us with. So it's not finished. We're still working on it, but it's already shown promise. We've, we've had several workshops with the EU faculty. Uh, we're getting more professors asking about this because it, it does fulfill a need uh, here at BU. We're hoping to, I should change that, because we have to. <laughs> we're gonna release this publicly. Um, we're developing it in the, in, the, uh, in the open, so everything is already on GitHub already, and it's for use by you and everyone. And if you have any questions, I will be happy to talk to you. First off, thank you, that's really incredible. Um, so I'm, I'll just put my bias on the table. I don't like React. <laughs> I look at it like, People don't. Like, no. Yeah, I didn't um, either. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, I, but never let it be said, I'm not willing to change. You mentioned that you saw WordPress kind of going that direction. Other than Gutenberg itself, right. sort of, do you see, a, we're using Vue right now. Yep. Um, do you see that becoming a problem for us as we're developing, or is that? I, two things. One, you say other than Gutenberg, and I, my immediate reaction is, yeah, what other than Gutenberg, right? Gutenberg is like an 800 pound gorilla. Um, so, but Vue is great, and we're also using Vue at, at BU. So I, I see them as uh, complementary. Um, WordPress was also questioning itself heavily about React, right? because of the heritage from Facebook. I think that's kind of one of the reasons why it's appropriate to be skeptical. Skeptical. <laughs> About React. Uh, but on a technical level, because it, because it is component-based, it does, I, I was very skeptical of React. I was like, why are we doing this in React? Like, Facebook has got plenty of attention, why do they need it more? Um, but I've been kind of won over. I work now with React more than I've worked with uh, Vue, but Vue has a good reputation. I, I once, once, once you're not necessarily like PHP, your 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 runtime is really the server, right? With uh, React and Vue, your runtime is really the browser. Once you make that shift, as long as it compiles and runs in the browser, I think the distinctions aren't so. Important. I think it matters more what style of JavaScript you're using than what framework you're using, honestly. I, and, and I would say if you have the chance to make that ES5, ES6 transition, that to me is almost a little bit more important than what framework you're using. Does that help? That's a great thing. Yes? So um, I think I got it right in the um, switch from backend to frontend, but then at the end you said, 
um, that you're not using that it's uh, independent from WordPress, um, the yes. caching component. So the only bridge between the Gutenberg backend or the WordPress backend and the front end is the JSON. Uh, exactly. Backend. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's so we're excellent. still using. Yeah. yeah. No. The, and again, that that having that bridge really helped us keep the front end kind of loose and fluid until we were ready to nail it down. And we're still using WP and script. We're still actually, we, I, I meant to mention this in an excellent question, we built our React questions uh, 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 um, package to consume exactly the same JavaScript, uh, JSON data format as Slick Quiz. Uh, so we, we kept the Slick Quiz format, we just wrote our own interface for you know, we departed with the questions that Slick Quiz doesn't handle. Um, but yeah, we actually we actually took that exact same data format and just wrote our own 